We finished with section one on the Diamond Sutra, and today um, we'll start with section two or chapter two. Chapter two, let's read the first paragraph. At the time, the elder Zuputi, who was in the assembly, rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder knelt upon his right knee, respectfully joined the palms of his hands, raising his hands with palm joint, and said to the Buddha, Rare and world honor one, how well the Tathagata protects and thinks of all Bodhisattvas, how well he instructs all the Bodhisattvas. So this is chapter two. This is Zubuddhi, ask a question. Sutra begins with someone asking a question. So at the time, the elder Suputi, who is Suputi? He is one of the Buddha's disciples. He is one of the ten most prominent disciples of the Buddha. He excel in his understanding of the doctrine of emptiness, sunyata. The doctrine of emptiness, we already have talked about it in detail. What is emptiness? Emptiness does not mean that there's nothing. This is empty, this is nothing. A box is empty, there's nothing inside. Is that emptiness? That's not what it means by emptiness. Uh, it's emptiness in terms of materiality, but the real meaning is not just the superficial meaning. We already have gone through that, uh, the meaning of emptiness or sunyata. That is a very important doctrine, philosophy of the Buddhist teaching. Uh, no one can understand well uh, the philosophy of, of, of the Buddha without understanding sunyata. Sunyata is the Sanskrit word for emptiness. Uh, so, Subhuti, he excelled in the understanding of emptiness. So in the Chinese language, he is Jie Kong Di Yi he is number one in explaining Sunyata. So in the Prajna Paramita Sutra of the Mahayana, there's a whole series, a whole bibliography of Prajna Paramita Sutras in the Mahayana uh, approach to the Buddhist teaching. It is generally Subhuti who, because of his prof profound thought, profound insight, explains the meaning of Sunyata. He was also, he was called elder at, a at that time, at the time the elder Subhuti asked the question. Why was he called elder? He was called elder because he was advanced in years, in years of being ordained, in the years of wearing the robe of the monk, in the years of becoming a monk, and venerated for his virtue. Remember in the first chapter, when the Buddha finished the meal, he put away his robe and bowl, he washed his feet, arranged his seat, and sat down. When the Buddha sat down, the whole assembly followed suit. Uh, and then, when a the, when the disciple asked a question in front of the Buddha, uh, they demonstrated their sincerity in five ways. Uh, you, when you initiated a question, uh, you become the uh, interlocutor. Uh, interlocutor, you become the main person asking the question. There's always someone who asks a question and then Buddha answers that question. So, and then there's so many other Buddhistatwas ask that question too. So the sutra is questions and answers, questions and answers. It's not just about how you worship, uh, it, it's, it's about life, about, about living. So, Subhuti asks started to ask a question. When you ask a question, it's not like that. You just sit in there and, and casually ask any question. You have to show your veneration. There's a certain procedure in India uh, you have to go through before you ask the question. 
To demonstrate your sincerity, you have to ask the question in five ways. If we read section two, the first paragraph, he rose from his seat. Subhuti rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder, knelt upon his right knee, respectfully joined the palms of his hands together. Before you ask a question, that's what you should do. Now, number one is to rise from your seat. You can just ask a question from your seat. It's impolite to do that. You don't just sit in there. And usually, in here, in um, now, we're so used to the casual way. Um, you just ask questions. Just raise your hand, and then you you, you when well, you ask. Sometimes, when people ask question, the the attitude is to challenge you. They they don't they don't want to get the insight of it. They don't want to get more information. They just want to challenge you. So they ask the question. And sometimes they lean back, and and, and in some. University or even schools, they have a cigarette in their hand, and then they ask that question, <laughs> or they lean back, or some of them even put, put their feet on the on the table. Have you been to those hall? I've been to those halls where students put one foot on the table and they ask the professor, "Hey, I got a question," <laughs> and the professor has to answer it. That's not the way. Without politeness, without courtesy, without sincerity, how can you learn? How can you learn to humble yourself? Uh, so, why did the disciple demonstrate the five ways before you ask a question? To humble yourself, to get rid of your ego. Because when you ask that question, you have that egoistic feeling that hey, you are wrong, or hey, you got to answer my question. I'm paying for a tuition fee. <laughs> you can't answer my question. I mean, in 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 human behavior, is an aggrandizement of self and ego, and because of this ego, we got into trouble. We are nurturing our ego every day in whatever we are doing. So you see a sutra at the beginning of the sutra when you ask the question, Subhuti rose from his seat. Number one, number two. Put put their clothes in order. That is to expose the right shoulder. Usually they have two shoulders cover. The roof cover the two shoulders, and when they want to show their veneration, they uncover. They bare one one part of the shoulder. There's a second procedure, second way. Bare one part of the shoulder, and also when they when they when they are working. When they're eating, when they're working, they also bare their shoulder. So when you ask a question, so you you rise from your feet, uh, rise from your seat, bare your your shoulder, and then what? And then uncover his right shoulder, kneel upon his right knee. Uh, that's number three. You have to kneel upon uh, with, with the right shoulder bare, touch the right knee to the ground, and then put. Their palms together, look up to the Buddha with veneration, with mindfulness, and then they ask that question. That's how you ask the question. So Supati started to ask a question, and he demonstrated his sincerity by by doing these five ways. And what did he ask? Let's find out more. Rare and world honor one. How well the Tathagata protects and thinks of all Bodhisattvas. How well he instructs all the Bodhisattvas. Now, what's the meaning of rare and world honored one? Let's find out what is world honored one. The Buddha has ten epithets or titles. The first one is Tathagata. Tathagata is a Sanskrit word. Interpreted as tata, that means thus, such as suchness, come. Tagata means come, so it means thus come. This is the implication that the Buddha's achievement of enlightenment has come through a path of practice that other sentient beings can follow. Thus is the reality, the truth. Thus the truth will come. When the Buddha come to this world to introduce the truth to sentient beings to follow, those are Tathagata. That means thus come. 
It's a Sanskrit word. So that's number one. There's the number one title, Tathagata. The second title, Arahat. Arahat is a Sanskrit word. Literally, it means one who deserves offering because he has completely rid himself of all selfish tendencies. In other words, he has no ego. His ego is all disintegrated, selfless. With the ego has gone. The ego is the problem ego. Some people say, "I have an ego," but the ego the ego is no good for you. It's because of that ego we got into trouble. That self. How do we find out more about that ego that we have? Our ego. Not just by one sitting in here, you find out your ego. Find out about your ego. What's the study of Buddhism? The first lesson in studying Buddhism is find out about yourself. Where does your ego come from? Let's resolve that problem. Find out more about it. So the second is the arahat. The, the second title is the arahat. The third. Title. It's in the Sanskrit language is Samya Sambuddha. He's also called the the Buddha is also called Samya Sambuddha. The Sanskrit word. What does that mean? Samya that means sam means correct. Samya that means omniscient. Omniscient means knows everything. Also, it means omnipresent. That means it's everywhere. Omnipotence. That means it's it's all powerful. The enlightenment, this put this person who is omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipotence. That means he knows all. He 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 has power in all, and he is present in all. The Samya Sambuddha. That's the third title. The fourth title, in the Sanskrit language, is Vidya Karana Sampana. It means. Perfect in wisdom and action, one who has consummated knowledge and practice. Consummated that means completely fulfill, completely fulfill knowledge and practice. So this is Samya Sambuddha. So when you are reading a sutra or any other books, the Buddha could be referred to as Samya Sambuddha. What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve Samya Sambuddhi. We're trying to achieve enlightenment. Buddhi is enlightenment. Samya that means correct, perfect, omnipotent, omnipresence, and omniscience. That means knowing all, present all, and power all. Once you are, once you, once you achieve samya sambuddhi. So that's the fourth title. How about the fifth title? The fifth title is quite simple. In the Sanskrit language, it's called Sudgata. That means well done, well gone, well finished. It's a person who has skillfully finished his holy job, finished his complete his job, leaving nothing behind. All finished. Good day, good day. Remember, good day, good day. Gone, gone. Zut good day. That means well gone. Good day, good day. Bra good day. Bra sam good day. Buddhiswaha. Let's remember the Heart Sutra. Gatte gatte that means gone, gone. Zut gatta gatta that means well, gone well. He's he's already gone to the shore of enlightenment. So zut gatte that means well gone. That also means this person who has become enlightened, who has achieved samya sambuddhi, has already gone from this shore of confusion, life and death, and life and death, life and rebirth. To that shore of enlightenment, that shore of samya sambuddhi. So that's also so that's well gone. The person who has well gone there, sugata. And and in India, somebody somebody like to use that as the first name. Hey, how are you, sugata? That means you already have gone. You leave nothing behind. You're a good worker. You've done your work. You finished. You consummated your work, and you left. You left nothing behind for people to do. 
Good worker never leave anything behind for, for, for others to do. He complete a good job. Sugata. So that's number five. Number six in the Sanskrit language is Lokavit. Lokavit means knower of the secular world. One who fully understands the nature and function of the world. He understands everything about the world. The knower of the world. Look of it. That's the six epithets or titles of the Buddha. How about the seventh? The seventh is tamer, to control. In the same way that a coach driver expertly control a team of horses, the Buddha control the three karmic activities. The three karmic activities of words, thoughts, and deeds. He completely put his the three karmic activities under control. What are these three karmic activities that poison us? Your action, your body, body, mouth, and, and mind. Physically, body, mouth, and mind. Body can do what? Body can do action. Mouth can do speech. Mind can do thought. Your action or your behavior, your speech, your thoughts polluted you, yourself. All your karmic activities, they are from these three sources. You watch them. Why are you meditating? Meditating is just relaxing myself and get, get good health and get good skin and good health and good body shape and, and uh, maybe uh, get away from depression and uh, relaxation. Is that the purpose of meditation? No. You got it all wrong. That's not the purpose of meditation. The purpose of meditation is to know your mind, understand yourself, not just to better your body. Of course, the byproduct of it is bettering your body. Because when you're meditating, you're understanding yourself, you put your whole body into relaxation and solitude. You can think properly, you can act properly. You can think much better than when you are in action, much better, better than when you are angry, you are jealous, you are greedy, you are arguing, you are yelling, you are shouting, much better than that kind of situations. So you really have to find out more about meditation. Meditation is not just relaxation and yoga, no. That's just tip of the iceberg. If you learn meditation for the purpose of yoga, you lost it. You lost the most valuable. The whole, you, just, you just look at the tip of the eyes, but you haven't looked at the underneath it. The major portion of it is underneath, not the tip. So, Tamer, that's the seventh title. What's the eighth title? The eighth title in the Sanskrit language is Sasta Deva Manusya Nam. What is Deva? Deva means demigods, fairies, people, existing beings who enjoy themselves in heaven. Heavenly beings, Deva, heavenly beings. We are human beings, but they are other beings. They are heavenly beings. They, they are in heaven. They are much happier than us. But, but don't go to heaven for, for, as an ultimate purpose because they still have to die. They may live millions of years, they enjoy happiness, but when, the karmic, when their karmic force is ripe, they still have to reincarnate. So the Buddha said, your destination is not heaven. You've got to go beyond heaven. Heaven is not the way to go. Of course, heaven is a million times better than the world, because this world is a world of suffering. Sasta Deva Manusyanam. Deva is heavenly being. Manusaya means humans. Sasta means teacher. So the Buddha is the teacher of heavenly beings and human beings. That's another name for, for the Buddha. Teacher of gods and men. So, do the Buddhists believe in God? Yes, they believe in God because they're heavenly beings. But they don't worship gods. They don't worship gods. Because they are still in the, in the paths of reincarnation, the six paths of reincarnations. These deva beings 
Why did they go to heaven? They performed good deeds. When they were humans, when they performed the ten good deeds all the time, then they have the karmic force to be reborn in heaven. What are these ten good deeds? Remember these ten good deeds? Always have to have them in mind. Not killing, not stealing, not lying, no sexual misconduct, and no, no frivolous speech, no cursing, no slandering, abstinence as much as possible from greediness, hatred, jealousy, you name those things. So these people, there are people like that who perform as much as possible. They're being binded, bound by morality. They always go to morality standard. They have very high morality standard. When they die, they were born in heaven. They don't even have to go through the bottle stage, some of them. Normally, when people die, they go through the bottle stage. Within the 49 days, they, may, may, they still roam around. But for people who are destined to be born in heaven, when they die, they don't even go to the bottle stage, they'll be reborn in heaven because they've done good deeds. For people who've done bad deeds, unvirtuous deeds, when they die, they don't go through the bottle stage, they immediately go down to, to hell. All the other intermediate ones, when they die, they usually stay in the bottle stage for 49 days before they, they reincarnate. That's why within the 49 days, you can do something for them. And, and that is called release of soul from, from purgatory. You can do certain things to release depressed souls from purgatory. And there are ceremonies like that. And, and people like monks to do it, to do, it, to, to do for the past, people who passed away. The people who always come to the temple, oh, my uh, certain person passed away and can have a group of uh, monks uh, uh, perform um, certain rituals. And these are rituals to, to release souls from purgatory. So, teacher of gods and, and men. That is the number eight titles. Now, how about the number, number nine title? Number nine title is just Buddha, B-U-D-D-H-A. Buddha, but, but means complete understanding. Buddha means the person. The person who achieved complete understanding. Understanding of prajna. Buddha, it's, it's Buddha or God? Buddha is not a god. God is still in material. You, you, you still look at things from the material perspective. All material, it disintegrates. All birth will die. Only if you are beyond birth, there will be no death. Anything that is born will die. You're still in the, in the, in, in the birth and rebirth cycle. Buddha go beyond that already, out of the materiality, out of form, out of sensation, perception, volition. We're still living within our consciousness. Our consciousness is characterized by sensation, perception, volitions, and the fallacious consciousness. We're still living in there. We've got to go beyond it. Um, arahats of the Theravada. Arahats have already eliminated the ego. They practice selfless, no self. And after a long series of practice, their ego is gone, disintegrated. When the ego is gone, there's no more mental defilements. You know mental defilements? Mental defilements that originates from egoistic feelings. Jealousy, hatred, violence, angry, greediness. You name them. All these mental defilements all come from the ego. Our heads already have eliminated them by practice of non-self contemplation and then they are out from reincarnation. They got into nirvana. 
Buddhist Atwa and Buddhas went go further. They even eliminate the notion of the Dharma. In other words, when you eliminate yourself, you have that method for the elimination of self. Even that method is empty, is void, is sunyata. Well, that you really have to learn more about it. Uh, okay, let's get back to Buddha, the ninth title, and the tenth title is what? The tenth title is Bhagavat in Sanskrit language. B H A G A V A T. Bhagavat. What does Bhagavat mean? Bhagavat means world honor one, honored by the world. So let's get back to this. Supati said, rare and world honored one. That is addressing the Buddha with one of the ten titles. Rare. How come he said rare? Rare in terms of what? Rare in terms of many ways. Rare means not happening all the time. Rare, not happening all the time. Why did he become so, why did he say rare? Because remember in, in the section one, the Buddha went, went, about, went about arms round, begging from one door to another door for the food. Remember why? Remember we said big shoes beg for food? Monks, they don't cook. They beg for food. And there's a lot of reason why begging. Begging not because of self-pitying or because of reliance on other people's food. There's a lot of meaning in begging. We, I already explained that. I'm not going to go through, go through it again. So begging from door to door and arms round, eating, mindfully walking in the city, mindfully returning, mindfully eating and washing the bowl and putting the ropes back and sitting, all these things, the Buddha is practicing mindfulness. And Supati sensed that Buddha's mindfulness today is quite rare. This mindfulness seems to suggest to Supati that there's a very philosophical assembly. A very, they're going to discuss something very philosophical. They discuss Prashna Paramita. So Supati out of his, because Supati is already an Arahat, out of his power, he knows that this is a rare occasion for the Buddha to talk. So he said, rare. I feel something. I'm going to ask this question. I feel something. So rare. Rare in terms of the occasion at that time. Rare in terms of the Buddha's appearance. Because Buddha does not appear all the time in this world. Within the last 2,600 years, the, the history of, of humanity only has one historical Buddha, Sakamuni Buddha. Before, there are seven Buddhas of the world already. How many Buddhas are there? Billions of Buddhas, not just one Buddha. Anyone who obtained enlightenment, perfect samna sambuddhi, is a Buddha. To people, to beginners, it seems, it seems so unusual. There's only one God, right? How come there's so many Buddhas? You've got to find more about it. Open your eyes. There's a door of treasure in the philosophy of Buddhism. If you always walk in front of the door and you don't go in, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> you never know what is inside. It contains one of the most resourceful literature of humanity, philosophical resource literature of humanity. Do you care to open the door or just walk in the door and say, bye-bye, I'm going to go on something else? Well, it's up to you. So, Rare and rare honor ones. Next, how well the Tathagata protects and thinks of all bodhisattvas. Uh, so what are bodhisattvas? Bodhisattvas, buddhi means enlightenment. Sattva means sentient beings. Bodhisattva means all sentient beings who is in the practice of pursuing enlightenment. He's neighboring the 
the realm of the Buddha or some are neighboring, almost get there, they're still practicing, they're still on their way to practice. A Bodhisattva is anyone who ceaselessly seeks unexcel, perfect enlightenment and bliss and welfare of sentient beings. He's always rendered compassion to sentient beings. Sometimes when I, the, when I first um, have access to Buddha Sutras, I always think, whenever I read Sutras, I always said that a Bodhisattva always, always render compassion to others and forgetting himself. And that doesn't apply. It doesn't, doesn't apply in the North American society. We always think of ourselves first. But when I study more and more about it, when you always put other people's interests in front of you, you're not going to be disadvantaged by it. Uh, because you always think of others, automatically your, your thinking perspective is widened. Then your wisdom level increases. People who have restricted egoistic feeling of only about himself, as time goes on, he's so restricted and restricted that he can only see himself. But whenever you see things, you always think, would it affect other people? You, you think in terms of others first, you automatically is benefiting yourself. You try it out. So when you return home, for example, and you see something obstructing the, uh, makes, maybe the lobby or something like that, and your first sight of it, oh, something is obstructing the pathway, and then say, oh, something is to kick on it, and, and, and he's going to stumble, and he's going to fall, and he's going to hurt himself. You think of other people. On the other hand, if you're selfish people, you think, is this my stuff? Who's getting my stuff on the pathway? Oh, it's not mine. I don't care. Do you see the different feelings? <laughs> you see the different feelings? So when you always think in terms of others, being a Buddhist Satwa, you widened your perspective. There was a story, and I don't know if I should go to story. If I go to story, I can never finish section two, but maybe I should still mention the story. It's a true story. There was a couple, um, he had two children, and uh, they went on holiday and they left the two children behind for the babysitter uh, to look after for the week, for seven days. Babysitter, very reliable babysitter. And they went away to Mexico and for seven days, retreat, summer retreat. And then they came back. They were driving back. And as they were approaching their street, the street is quite long, but as, as they approached the middle of the street, they saw a house on fire. A house on fire. So John hurriedly got, got down and there was a woman crying right at the door. The fire was not so bad, it was almost, it, it started. It started, it's going to glow, the, the flame is going to, going to glow, and, 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 the, and there, was, there was a woman terrified, running out and, ah, help, oh, my house is on fire. And he was trying to get, she was trying to get some water and splash onto it. it he was so, she was so excited that she forgot about 911. <laughs> she was just so excited, nervous. So the man got down, and what's happening? Oh, there's a fire. Uh, my children is in the house. My children are in the house. And then the man wanted to go in to, to fetch the children for the lady. But the wife said, hey, John, watch it. The house is going to collapse any time if it's burning too much. But John hurried and went in and, 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 and grabbed two children by the hands and, and came out. And when she came out, put the children down, and the lady was hugging the, the children, and they were getting out from the flame. And then the, la the, and then the lady suddenly said, oh, there were two, ch two more children inside the house. And the man thought, yes, when I was trying to fetch the children in, 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 in a hurry, I heard cries of two other children. Yes, I should go in again. And the wife said, you're crazy. Don't go in there. The house is going to collapse anytime. But John, being so bodhisattva, so compassionate, you know, he, he wanted to help. He rushed in. 
he got the two children again and came out and saved two more children. And as she put the children back, the children look up at him and say, "Ah, Dad, it's his children. The babysitter went, have some urgent things to do, shopping, and put his two children with that inside that house for the, for the woman to look after. He was actually saving his two children. You understand? See what I mean? So if you're being selfish, you don't want to go and you don't, you don't even save your own two, two children. So you see the, the causality, the, 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 the karmic activities, the karmic inference of this, of these things. And John didn't know he was actually saving his two children. And his wife actually didn't want him to go back. His wife said that he was crazy. How crazy you are, risking your life for other people. See? So, how come a Buddhist Tattwa is always thinking about helping others, putting the welfare of others in front of him? How come Buddha say that Buddhist Tattwa always think in terms of others first, not of yourself? There's a meaning for it. So do you want to be a Buddhist to us? Only Buddhist to us can become a Buddha. So he said, rare and well honor one, how well the Tathagata protects and thinks of all Buddhist to us. That means how well the Buddha always protects Buddhist to us. The Buddha always think of Buddhist to us, and the Buddha always instructs Buddhist to us, teach the Buddhist to us. So, so Subhuti asked, Buddha, the rare well-honored one, how well the Buddha protects and thinks of Buddhist Tattva and instructs them. Next paragraph. Well-honored one, virtuous men and women, develop the supreme enlightenment mind. How should their mind abide? How should they control their thoughts? Here's the question. That means, honor one. How should the Buddhist Tattva abide their minds? How should they control their thoughts? That's the question. That's the most important question. How to control your thought? How to abide your mind in the spiritual development? If you know how to do it, if you know how to abide your mind in peace, in that spiritual development continuously, and if you know how to control your wandering thoughts, you're right on your way. That's the first question, very practical question. Nothing about Buddha, we all pay the respect and worship to you, and that's enough. Buddha, you will bless us. You give us the power. You give us everything. No, he didn't ask that. He asked, how do we practice? How can we be better? How do we understand ourselves? How do we abide our mind in peace so that we can help others also to abide the minds in peace? How do we control our mind so that we always can control our karmic activities? How, come, uh, how can our behavior, our speech, our thoughts be holier and purif purified so that we are right on the path of spiritual development? It's about practice and development, not about blind faith. Not about just faith and belief, no. Faith is only the first step. All the, st the other steps depends on how you astray your steps forward. How should they continue in practice consistently without forgetting the ultimate purpose of perfect enlightenment? In the practice of Samya Sambuddhi, perfect enlightenment, huh? in the practice of Samya Sambuddhi, one of the most important key is patience. Patience is very important in spiritual development. And I have experience with that. I can see that over the years, there's so many people come and go and come and go. They practice for one or two times and they think they got it and they, they never come again. They thought that one meditation is enough and they learn all and they go home and practice. That's not it. So patience is very important in spiritual development. Um, my experience is, is that some people start off being very interested in, in the Buddhist teaching. It is, as it is new and different from what they think. In the first year, they are very conscientious. But as time goes on, 
they lose their patience, uh, particularly if they have uh, problems with their daily lives and, and they, do, they do not know how to uh, apply the Buddhist teaching to resolve their problems. Then in the second year, their interest is diminishing and finally they totally forget about the, the Buddhist teaching. Um, patient, they don't have the patience. So it is, it is significant that virtuous men and women learning and practicing development of Samya Sambuddhi uh, to abide the mind in patience, hold it and continue with the same conscientiousness. It's very important. As I always give the example of drill, drilling well for oil in Alberta. If you drill from one oil to another well, one well to another well and try different wells without getting too deep, you won't get it. You concentrate in one or two. You get deeper and deeper and deeper. You take your patience, finally you get it. A rolling stone gathers no moss. Some people read from one book to another. They never can go beyond half a book. And they start another one. And some people meditate for one or two times, or even maybe a year, and they think, oh, just concentrating on the nose tip? Oh, too simple. I know it. I can do it. A three-year-old may be able to do it, but an 80-year-old may not get the enlightenment. It's simple, but it's complicated. And I, well, for section two, for chapter two, I only finished halfway. Maybe I'll stop at this point, but please remember the first question asked by Suputti. How do the Bodhisattvas abide the mind in spiritual development? How do they abide the minds in, in peace? How to do it? How, how to do it? How to control their, their thoughts so that they are right on the path of develop, spiritual development, on the path of Samya Sambuddhi. And the whole Diamond Sutra concerns about the mind. The whole Diamond Sutra concerns about understanding your own mind. Do you want to understand your own mind? You think you understand it? Some people say, it's my mind, it's in me. Of course, it belongs to me, I understand my mind. As I always say, if you understand your mind, how come you become so mad? How come you curse? How come you get greedy? How come you do all these things? How come you lie? How come you kill? How come you commit sexual misconduct? If you can control your mind, if you know your mind, you shouldn't be doing all those wrong things. You should be perfect. 